So which which is better if I if I write here? Which better? Can you guys can you see both? Okay. So I would like to briefly kind of go over where we were uh, last time. Uh, so what we're doing is we're looking at the seismic refraction survey, which allows you to try to find out, uh, and this is, I think, the main application for engineering, you know, what the thickness is of some uh, upper layer of bedrock and generally you have the situations where you've got a V1 and a V2 with this V2 being the bedrock being greater than, than V1. So what we're going to do is, is to, first of all, generate the travel time curves. So we have a source and then we lay out receivers on an equal basis like this. And the first way that we're that we're, we're going to, to treat is one that comes across like this. And what's what's that called? So now I'm I'm going to try to get your name. So Christopher. Where's Christopher? Ah, good. Uh, Pardon me? A direct ray. So that's a direct way, and that travels right along the surface. And if we plotted the travel time curve, so this is T here against X, so that's X is this distance this way, then what is this travel time curve uh, look like, uh, Robin? It's going to be on a slant downwards. So it's going to be on a slant like this. And the slope of this guy, Lindsay, with an A? Ah, okay, thank you. It's going to take me a while, so bear with me on this. But you guys were so quiet over the last couple of weeks. It's just like, oh. Okay, what's the slope of this? Um, right, so, and, and then how, what's, how is that going to relate to speed? So diff x is equal to vt. Right, so this is going to be 1 over the speed of, of V1. Good. So that's that's this guy who's coming along here. So we just have to measure, we just have to make sure that we've got some arrivals that are coming from here and pick off those first arrivals. And okay, now that gives us that gives us already the velocity of the top layer. There's then going to be another layer that comes in here. The wave is going to go down here, and it's going to refract along that bottom interface. And at what speed is it going to travel as it goes along here? Michelle? Michelle, thanks. What speed is this wave travel along here? Speed what? Uh, yeah, but a speed V1 or V2? Anybody else? V2. So this wave travels along here at a speed V2. Okay? <coughs> Question. Does this wave, can I see this refracted wave at this particular GFO? No. No. The first location is going to be something so here's here's an angle and what's that angle going to be called that's going to be called the critical angle you could put a c or not and so that means that there's going to be a distance here and what are we going to call that 
Anybody? Jesse? That's going to be the critical distance. That's going to be the distance that we have to go away from here before we see the that uh, first uh, critical arrival. So once we get to this critical distance, and that critical distance might be here, okay, then there's going to be an arrival that's, that's going to come in and it is going to travel like this. We've already said that's going to be speed V2. And so this has got a slope of 1 over V2. You go and you look at your seismograms, you pick off the first arrivals, and those two things are going to form straight lines. One of them is going to tell you the velocity of the top layer. One of them is going to tell you the velocity of the second layer. So you've already got two of the three things. You've got this guy, and you've got this guy. The only thing that we don't know is the thickness. So how do we get the thickness? For that, we actually have to we have to do some computations, which are really sim simple, but they just require that you use Pythagoras' theorem and you know, try to figure out the lengths of the, of, of the lines. So what we're doing is we're going to have to compute what the arrival time is for this refracted wave. And we can show that it's equal to something like this. It's x over v2 plus ti. So this refracted wave comes in as x over v2 plus some, some constant. This formula shows that the slope of this line is 1 upon v2. And this guy here, what do we, what do we call him? And why do we have it as sub, sub i? Charlie? The time until it hits the other layer? Uh, not really. Anybody else? Intercept time. It's the intercept time, right? So if we take this, so this is the, nothing is going to arrive till here, okay? So we have to be at a certain distance before we get this. This, so this point here is x sub c. That's a straight line. We could project it back to this point here, and that is my intercept time. And now, the good thing about this is I actually have a formula for it. So I'm written in here as x over v2 plus ti, but if I look at it over here, there is an expression that you guys can derive. It's actually derived in the GPR notes. I don't want to go through that over here. I don't think it's particularly useful. <coughs> but this intercept time is given by this thing here. So Ti is equal to 2z v2 squared minus v1 squared over v1, v2. So is that going to be enough information for us to get our third variable? <clears throat> or what do we do? Technical? What's, our, what's, the, what's the variable that we're missing, and do we have enough information to get it? Could be or something really hard. Yeah, so the thickness, right? Do we have enough information to get it? Yeah. How? Because you have TI because you're projecting the line back, so you just have to rearrange for Z. That's right. So I've got TI, put this over here, this under here, divide by two, so I've got an expression for Z. I'm done. Good to go. So how simple is that, right? You want to try to, like, I mean, you can imagine 
you're, you're out in you know, some site characterization place, and you want to have, like, okay, how deep is the bedrock? Well, you've got two options. You could drill. Okay. The other is maybe there's a chance of just setting up a seismic experiment, and then you go ahead and you uh, lay out some receivers, and you have a shot. I'm going to talk to you a bit about both of those in a second. And uh, you, you record the seismograms, get the first arrivals, plot them up like this, calculate a slope, calculate another slope, calculate an intercept, and you've got some information. So what what thickness is that measuring? Is it just directly under the shot? Like what if you have a layer that varies in thickness along the survey line? Good point. So if you have if you have a layer that looks like this, okay, which you might have, then if you have a have a source out here, then as long as things don't get too crazy, okay, that energy kind of comes along here and it gets traveling through this. So it'll, it, it's over here, it's sort of putting up energy here, here. So always at the critical distance with respect to, to the normal, and it sort of puts energy. So it's going to make, so instead of this being a nice straight line, it's going to be a little bit of fluctuations. But then, you know, there's codes out there that can, start to handle that. The most complicating thing that we're going to look at, and we're only going to do it briefly because we simply don't have very much time, is the following one where now my interface might actually look like that. So suppose I have a dipping interface. Then I'll show you that we could get those uh, information out about this and actually get you know, this distance here and that distance there, and that would also give you a dip. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, well, one thing, because I, I would actually like you guys to go through the GPG and actually derive this guy. I mean, just it just requires you use some geometry and you know find the lengths of lines, and every time you know the length of line divided by the velocity, and it'll give you the time. But there's this. I, I wrote this funny thing up here. It's called a velocity triangle. And I'm wondering, A, if anybody has looked through the GPG, and B, if you have any idea of where a velocity triangle could come in. Because that velocity triangle is actually needed to give rise to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a crucial moment. Anybody? Darius? I remember seeing it when I went through the GPG for the lab. Yep. But it was under the time travel the time travel section. Okay. Okay, so I just want to tell you where it goes. If I told you it comes from Snell's law, would that be of any assistance? Yes. Okay. What do we do? <laughs> so what's what's Snell's law? Somebody. Sine theta one and sine theta two. Yeah, so sine theta one, yeah, you read over V one, sine theta two, over V two, or mix those guys around. It's nice actually writing like this because eventually we're going to have multi layers and then you just kind of keep going. It's sine theta three over V three, sine theta four. Right? Now, when we have a critical refraction, okay. So now we're coming down here. What's theta 2? 90. 90. So sine 90 is? So for the critical refraction. So theta 1 for the critical refraction is, is that. So sine theta critical is equal to V1 upon V2. <coughs> okay, so if I wrote that on, how do you go from this to this guy? Definition of the sine of an angle is over 
There's sin theta c. Sin theta c is v1 upon v2. So that means that this is v1. That means this is v2. So what is this guy? v2 squared minus v1 squared. Off the power of the f. Perfect. OK? So that's where it all comes from. So with that velocity triangle, with just trying to figure out, OK, what's the length of every ray? And what's the velocity? You can get the travel times for, for, for any of these things. And that gives you the complete basis. Uh, good. So I think we're good to go. <laughs> so in summary, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go out. You're going to measure these guys, plot the data, pick the first arrival. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You'll do that a little bit in, in the lab. So there's these. Remember, every arrival now is replicated with a wavelet. So you're going to pick at a particular point on that wavelet. And usually it's the emergent part of the wavelet when it first starts to come in. And you can see we've got a straight line here, we've got a straight line here, we've got another one here. Each of these straight lines has intercepts. And so you can go ahead and uh, identify the layers, get the velocities, and then Okay, that is the basics of refractions. I said there's only going to be a couple of extra complications that come in because of things that were that were undulating or a few other things, and we'll take account of them uh, a little bit towards the end. What I want to do now is kind of go back because we haven't really talked about the whole deal, right? We haven't really talked about the sources. We haven't really talked about the instruments that are measured. I've shown you these, these pictures, but we really haven't talked very much about what they're actually doing. So a source is anything that can shake the ground. So it could be uh, a, a natural source. Right? So we could, everybody's familiar with Earthquake, so you've seen those, so that's a possibility. Could be man made, explosives, anything. And then the receivers could be anything that measures something. So it could measure a, a velocity, or it could measure an acceleration, or anything like that. So those are going to be the two guys. And let's just look at a couple of sources. So on a global scale, we've got earthquakes. So you guys are all familiar with this. So here's map of the world here's uh, you can sort of see the plates that are going on here you've got these big subduction zones so we get different kinds of earthquakes in different uh, lo locations uh, so we can have uh, a, a normal fault a, a thrust fault something that's co coming up like this uh, we could also have a strike slip fault uh, going down into the you know into here we've got these big thrust faults as the Pacific plate goes down. Right? So the, you know, the plate's going down. It's sort of uh, binding elastically with a, a plate that's up here. Everything gets deformed, and then energy gets released. You get a bigger plate. So that's one way. Over here in San Andreas, we've got sort of strike slip faults. And on the uh, ocean ridges, you've basically got tension faults. That, that, so we got all kinds of ways of moving rocks. Each one of them is going to give rise to different types of motion, but we can go ahead and measure that. On the ground, for the uh, a lot of things are done with the uh, on land for the oil industry, and they actually use these things. Uh, they're, they're called vibrators. Uh, so it's it's just a big mass of truck. And underneath there, they have a plate. And that plate just sort of oscillates up and down. Actually, it's the truck that's oscillating up and down. And uh, that's pumping energy into the ground. Because uh, hydrocarbons are often pretty deep, uh, you need to get a lot of energy in. So you line all these guys up, and you get a whole bunch of them. And they're all in sync. And 
they're trying to vibrate up and down, shake the ground enough that uh, you get uh, waves that go <coughs> inside the earth and then reflect back up. Uh, you could also do this. This is not a good idea. Uh, but you know, dynamite is uh, one way of doing things. If you do use dynamite, you try to bury it so it doesn't explode. At, in the oceans, you can get uh, ships that have a, uh, a source behind them, or in this case, you can't see it very well, but here you've got four ships, and each of them has got an array of receivers that's coming out, and ultimately, those data are being uh, combined to generate a picture of the, the Earth's subsurface. This picture is reflection seismology picture. We're going to talk about that. But the idea of a source, uh, whether it's used for refraction or whether it's used for reflection, let's say, just does he have some way of putting energy in, into the ground? For geotechnical work, Actually, a lot of the things that you do are, are, are sometimes like this. Uh, it's still not uncommon to actually have a, uh, a what's called a hammer seismograph. So this guy, gal, swinging a hammer. See, we, equal opportunity. Uh, she's she's swinging a hammer. Uh, this guy's on a little bit. Poor pictures. On a little bit of a thumper truck, and this guy has got a little bit of a dynamite ex explosion. <laughs> one of the ones that, uh, uh, this is this one's very commonly used uh, by geotechnical, Golder, for instance, or frontier geosciences use these guys a lot. Uh, they're basically, it's like a shotgun, right? So basically that's what it is. This is a shotgun you put in a shotgun explosive, and uh, that's enough impact out of the bottom here, that it kind of radiates uh, energy outward. And one thing about a hammer seismograph is that, or a hammer seismic, is you can take it all kinds of places. What's interesting here is that, so here's the hammer, and you notice that there's a cord that extends from here into a box. And the reason for that is that it's very important to know the timing of when you put a signal in. And so you therefore want to, you know, as you're striking a, a, a base plate, and there, that's what happens here, there's usually some kind of a metal plate under here that's coupled to the ground so that when you hit it, that energy couples in. Uh, you want to know exactly when that hits. And so you record the moment that hits and then everything else from these other geophones is then sync to that so you know exactly how long it took the signal to leave from here to even the first two. Four. And then you string these guys out uh, along a, a line and uh, you can go to all kinds of places that are, you know, lower mainland type of thing, very easy to do. So that's the source. And simple, but a whole variety. So now I've got the geophone, geophone and seismic uh, recorders. We use them <coughs> synonymously, and they kind of operate like this. Most of them have some kind of a spring system that's to them, and the 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 ideal seismograph looks a bit like this. And in fact, here's here's one here, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. I'll pass this guy around and you can see, but I'll, I'll explain a bit first and then you'll kind of get an idea of what's happening. The, like the best seismograph that you could obtain would be one from the, so let's go here, sitting someplace here on the earth, and here's the moon. And you had a cord that was running down from the moon, and it was attached to an, an instrument here. And you could then measure, okay, when the Earth moved, okay, up and down, 
just how much this guy has been has, has been moving. We can't do that, but we can do something that's similar to that. We have have a, have a contraption that looks like this. So it's got a uh, a frame, and then there's a spring that's attached to it. And sometimes you'll hear the word zero length spring because it's kind of carefully carefully tuned. And the idea is that this is sort of sitting here and we've got attached to the spring some kind of, uh, usually it's kind of like a copper coil of, of wire. That's what this guy is. So you can see that there's just a whole bunch of wire that's, that, that, that's in here. And these out guys, outside guys are magnets. When the Earth moves up, then from an inertial per perspective, this guy is kind of staying, staying in the same position. So it's just like the coil is there, and this magnet kind of goes up and down and up and down. So that's what you would ideally like, like to have. And my first question is, so if I had a device like that, why would it measure anything? Suppose that I'm sitting here, okay? And you can hear it click, right? So, but if I just flip this stuff up and down, then what's happening is I've got a coil here. I'll, I'll pass it down. There's a little, little coil, and there's a magnet around the outside. So why is that measuring something? It's inducing a current in the, in the copper wire as the magnet, as it moves in the magnet. Perfect. How many, how many people got that? So you, you, you've all, I don't at some point, been uh, introduced to how a generator works, right? So we so basically, if you've got a <coughs> any kind of a moving conductor in a magnetic field, then we build up a current, and once we have a current that's flowing in there, we can we can measure the current. So as this as this magnet moves up and down, okay, with respect to this uh, uh, copper you know, copper core. Okay, we've got a changing magnetic field through there that gives rise, so rise to a current. Then we could measure that current, and we're good to go. So that's the basics of most of the uh, magnetometers, sorry, seismometers. Uh, often when we uh, go out into the field, uh, they don't quite look like that. They'll have a pointy end on the on the bottom. Has anybody ever ever worked for an oil company? You know, summer jobs in Calgary. Anybody? Yeah. And so, what did you do? Oh, okay. Did did you ever get out in the field or no? Anybody has got um, a colloquial name for these guys? They're often called jugs. Actually, I don't really know where that comes from, but they. Uh, another term for these is jugs, and people who carry them around are called jug hustlers. And the uh, the, the great thing about these is that you just uh, you know you kind of put them on the ground, and then you they're rugged enough that you can step on the top. In fact, you could just basically kick them in. So you just kick it in, move on your. They're separated by every, you know, five or ten meters or something on a on a cable, and then you just lay these guys out in, in, in the string, and then you've got your geophones planted. Yeah, and you can see there's the geophone planted, and then it's connected up to uh, a cable, and that cable will run things back to a recorder. We did something a little bit different in the first lab. Remember, we did that uh, 
uh, seismic experiment. That was a little bit different because I've, I've got I've got it stretched out here, but or sketched out. But uh, I, I, anybody know what was happening there? Because we weren't. <laughs> that was a bit different. We didn't hit something at the back end. You had this at this machine that kind of looked well. There's part of it. Uh, it was, your your cylinder was kind of clapped in. So it wasn't that there was any, uh, you know, physical tapping or anything like that at the back end. Anybody got some idea of what's going? Yeah. Um, when you apply pressure to something that has a crystalline structure, um, it deforms the structure, so it releases that pressure, releases energy. Perfect. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, uh, a, a transformation from like electrical voltage to uh, crystalline energy. So now we've actually got, so we, we've got a transducer here that takes a voltage and then it changes shape a bit. And then now that shape change can propagate through and then another transducer back here and then come out here, which is now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not exactly sure it's what you said, but it's, we're pretty, we're pretty close. Yeah. So you, the, the point is you can take energy in one form and transfer it to that. And, and so that's what, what happens here. We've got an electrical impulse, at, well, or particular harmonic that, that's put in. That's actually an electrical wave that's going in. So there's, there ain't nobody moving, aside from a few electrons. Uh, and that, that gets in this transducer and there's this... Uh, this transducer changes it actually to now a physical motion that propagates through that physical motion taken up by this transducer changes it back to an electrical form and then can, can measure things. So that's how that that works. So there's quite a few ways of sort of uh, skinning the cat. That's what you did in the lab, and uh, previously we saw something a bit uh, more physical. We were going to show this, but we couldn't quite get the airdrop to work. Maybe on Friday. Uh, people have iPhones. There has anybody? Well, if you if you go back, like, it turns out that there's accelerometers on the iPhone. In fact, on most of these devices. And does anybody know why <laughs> Apple or anything would be keen to put accelerometers in here? Measure. Motion acceleration. The prime reason. Uh, I thought originally it was so the device knew which way it was oriented, so that the screen could flip depending on how you're holding it. But really surprising other uses they had in mind. Yeah, I think the, I think that was my understanding is that the first reason <laughs> we put these in was to record so that they would actually have a record of what actually happened to the phone. Like somebody could come in and say, oh, my phone, my, my phone's not working. And they say, well, did you drop it? And they say, no, no, I didn't drop it, nothing, right? Uh, but actually, if you have a record inside that there was this, you know, huge, you know, uh, acceleration on, on this thing, uh, then you can say, well, sorry, your phone has, has been dropped. And then the other thing that just came out is, yeah, so you want to orient your phone in a particular way so that the screen, you know, you, you turn it this way and then your, your screen goes this way, turn it around, it follows you around so you can tell what's up, what's down. Uh, so all of those things require uh, accelerometers. And this is actually kind of amazing when you think about it. So here's the accelerometer. To a first order, it's got that coil inside, and here's your magnet on the outside. And there's lots of other stuff too, right? But what's kind of amazing <laughs> about this is they take this, so it's just like this guy that's coming around, and then you make three of them. Because you can only measure you know, motion or acceleration in one direction. You want to have all three, so you need three of these guys. So they take each of those three, and they put them on a chip. So now you, you take this, and now you just got this little chip, right? 
and you put three <coughs> accelerometers into there, and you put all that stuff in, and it's someplace in here. So everything is like really tiny, and <coughs> yeah. So most of you know, so your your accelerometer is you know sitting someplace in here, and it's way smaller than you know, the width of, of, of your thing. And that's actually measuring all three components. And there are apps around that you can download various kinds of seismic apps. So if you just sign on to you know, iTunes or wherever, or just Google, uh, there will be some that you can download. And if we get the AirPlay going, I'll show you then on the screen what these things look like. And the reason that it's kind of interesting is that it connects signals that we are seeing with with ground motion, because we can show that if we make the ground move in a particular direction, then one particular component of, of this uh, works. So there's your, uh, your, your, your iPhone app. Same principles. So whether you're dealing with looking at an iPhone or looking at a big uh, expedition in the ocean, all of these things kind of come down to the same basic. So a couple of the uh, issues that I wanted to talk about. You know, life, life is like this, right? You get some, we just showed that uh, we've got a situation that looks like this. We've got a V1 and a V2, and we've got some kind of thickness, uh, a, Z. Uh, we can actually get all, all of those parameters, no, no problem. But sometimes things uh, get more complicated, and we might have a situation that looks like this, in which case, as long as the velocities keep increasing, there really isn't any problem. You know, we can have a ray that comes down like this, and you know, then refracts down like this, comes along here, refracts up, and comes up like here. And now, here's our direct, here's our 1 over V1, 1 over V2, and then there'd be another guy coming in here at 1 upon V3. So if we could recognize him, we'd, we'd, we'd see that. Okay? But there's a couple of... Of, of times that things don't work out quite as, as, as nicely. And one of those is when this velocity uh, is either smaller than V1, in which case we've now got a low velocity zone, or actually if it's really quite thin. And I just I want to show you these guys. So in, in this case, so in this case here, I've got three layers. I've got a refraction that comes along here. But if this velocity, if that layer was low velocity, then I'd never have any wave that comes across like this, right? So if V2 is less than V1, then I, I never have that. And so the only thing I would have is this guy here, in which case I don't have this arrival, so I just have this. So I've got a 1 over V1, a 1 over V3, but I don't have any indication that, that he's here. So if I don't have anything from a a second layer in here, then I'm kind of kind of hooked. The other thing is that even if this, so let's suppose I've got a V1, a V2, and a V3, even if these are progressively larger velocities, so that initially I might have something that looks like that, if I start to shrink this uh, layer thickness, 
then what's going to happen is that this travel time curve, I'm still going to get a refraction from that second layer, but the guy, this guy coming in on the bottom of the third layer is actually going to get around quickly enough that I don't see much of a manifestation of him. And at some point I could actually have a low velocity zone. So there is, there is even a, still is a refraction, but it's not a first arrival. And so if I'm just looking for first arrivals, I just see a B1 and, and, and a B3. And so therefore I've got a hidden layer. So I can get a hidden layer either because it's a low velocity zone, never get a refraction, or I can get a hidden layer simply because it's simply a bit too thin and it cannot manifest itself as a first arrival. Uh, we've done all that. Here's the other case, kind of come back to a little bit more of a, of a complication. And that is, well, what happens, and this is probably a first order effect in a lot of geotechnical studies where the bedrock is, you know, dipping at, some particular, some particular value. And this is designed to show that. So we've got a layer with velocity V1, another with V2. V2 is greater than V1. So I'm going to get a refraction along here. And so there's, there, there's not going to be any, any, any problem there. But if I just have the information from a single shot, so let's suppose I've got this guy, we'll make him come down like this, and I've got a shot here, and I've got <laughs> my receivers here. And now the information is coming down like this. So it's still going to get refracted. And then it comes like this. Okay. If I plot my travel time curve here, so let's suppose that I've got T and X. Uh, if, if I had as my reference that I was going to have a, have a flat Earth, then I'd have you know something then that looks like like that. If, however, instead of being flat, <coughs> this interface is going to dip. Okay, so let's suppose it's dipping down. Then I'm still going to get something that is propagating up like this. But what's going to be the effect on my travel time curve? So it's still going to be a straight line. But if now if I look to see, so let's suppose this is V true, 1 over V true. Then my question is, if it's dipping down like this, and I'm going this way is my travel time curve which is going to still be straight line is it going to be something that looks like this or something that looks like that in other words i'm going to have a, a, a velocity and i could call it down dip so i could call v i huh, can't remember exactly but let's call it v down So I'm going to have a, something that's a slope of the down. And is this thing going to be have a, a, a lower slope or a higher slope? Higher slope. Yeah, higher. Who's, 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 who thinks higher? Okay. 
So as we come down here, okay, then the length of this is going to increase. So it's always going to look like it's taking a bigger time, right? So as I come down here, the time that it takes to arrive is actually going to be progressively larger than it would be for, for, from the normal. And so that means that this slope is going to be, uh, this slope is going to be bigger and uh, yeah, if affected that way. Conversely, if I go this other way, then as I go this way, so now I've got V upslope. Now as I'm coming th this way, the, the path length is progressively shorter, so it just takes less and, and less time. So the result of that is as follows, that if I have a, a shot that goes down dip and comes up here, particular ray path, if I now go back the other way, so the blue is starting from here and going up here, we can see that they have the same, they travel the same path. So if I look in this, distance, so here's the shot one, so let's suppose that's, that shot S1, and now I have a shot S2, and the first one then starts off, so here's my direct arrival, Here's the direct arrival, so those are both going to have the same uh, <coughs> the, the, the same slopes. But now when I look at arrival times that come uh, from the shot to the left to, to the right, there's going to be a time up here in which the shot S1 will arrive up here at some time and I could put a shot S2 and it's going to arrive back at shot S1 at exactly the same time, right? Because they're traveling exactly the same. Path. That particular time that we've got here is a very special time and it's called T reciprocal. So it's, it's called the reciprocal time. And what it says is that I'm taking Placing my, sh my my two shots, so I'm, I'm always I have a shot and then I put an end receiver and then I invert that and I put a shot where the end receiver was and receiver where the first shot was, and so I've got a complete reciprocity where I have two uh, two uh, waves going from different directions, but they take exactly that same time. So if we look at the plot from here, from the red, we go down dip. So you see that down dip, we've got progressively farther to, to go. So it's got a steeper slope. This has got a shallower slope. They arrive at the same time. That's our reciprocal time. And we can call it up dip and down dip, so I get two apparent, so these are now apparent velocities. And I can use that information with a couple of, of, of formulas that tells me what the time is for my initial shot, what the time is for the, for the reciprocal shot. And for each of these, I can get, I can get an intercept, this guy here. So I get an intercept T2 and an intercept T2 prime, Ti prime. And I've got formulas for, for these guys. And that allows me to get this depth underneath the reciprocal shot and this depth underneath. The first. So that comes back to your point earlier. If we've got something that's that's varying, what actually do we mean by, by the depth? And with you know, these formula and know, knowing what my two slopes are, up dip, down dip, and knowing what this reciprocal time is, and also these intercept times, I've got all the information. Uh, okay, so what we'll do next time, that just about finishes this up. What we'll do next time is start 
the seismic reflection. What I'd like you to do is to go on to the seismic uh, basics and also to the apps. There's an app there for generating a normal incident seismogram. If you can do that, then you'll be kind of well versed with what we want to talk about on Friday.